you very much for that very kind introduction. At least I assume it was a kind introduction. Dobre uh, diem. Are you having a good conference so far? Good conference? Yeah. 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 Well, there's still my talk to get through, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I, I feel I've only got like five minutes left to deliver, deliver my keynote now. We're, we're okay for an hour? Okay, good, good. Well, thank you very much for staying. I know it's been uh, a long, uh, long day and it's a nice sunny day, so you might have been tempted to go out and enjoy the, uh, the fine Moscow sunshine. So, uh, thank you for staying with us. Although I did hear a rumor that there's uh, free beers afterwards, so maybe that's got something to do with it. Um, I'm, I'm an independent uh, consultant these days, but uh, it was about, well, I've been an independent consultant for about seven or eight years. And prior to that, I was working for a test consultancy, uh, headquartered in, in London and with offices in, in Germany and various places around, around Europe. And one of the things that uh, I was tasked with was this question. I don't know if you've sort of pondered this particular issue before, you know, what's the, what's the product of testing? It's certainly something that uh, was of concern to the management of this particular consultancy I was working for. So uh, the situation was, you know, we weren't the cheapest guys on the street, I'll put it that way. We were providing testing services, we were fairly proud of the fact that we had what we thought were you know, high quality people, we were a reasonably premium uh, brand, but there were a lot of other competitors out there. There were a lot of um, alternatives, there were certainly a lot of offshore um, test providers out there, and we felt that we were being, you know, losing a little bit of market share because other people could offer, you know, people who test cheaper than we were offering. And uh, so it was, the task was given to me by the sort of board level management of what, what we do about this, how do we, how we preserve our, our price point. I said, well, it shouldn't be that hard. It's like any marketplace, there's room for you know, variance in price. If you think of the car market, there are those who are happy to buy, go out and buy a cheap car, uh, but there are those who are prepared to pay more for what they consider to be a premium quality product. So all we need to do is prove that we've got the premium product and therefore we're worth the extra price. But that just sort of shifted the problem to this question. Well, we're a services company, we provide people who test. So what really is our product? So how do we, how do we prove that we've got uh, a higher quality product that's worth the extra money? So this turned out to be not an easy question to answer. And if you're pondering, or if you believe you've got the answer to this in your own head, I hope it's not the Q word. So quality is not the product of testing. I think that, that needs to sink in. We, we as testers, if we're doing our job well, we're not producing quality. What we are producing is information about quality. And the important thing for us to remember is that we do so because we're an in, we, we provide that information so that people can make decisions. So if we are doing a better job of testing than the next guy, the thing that we are producing, the thing that we've given our customer more of is more confidence in those decisions that they make. So I would argue that this is, this is my, my axiom, if you like, that the product, the thing that we produce, if we're doing our job well, is greater confidence for the people that need to act on the information that we provide. Okay? And just to be clear, this is not confidence in the product under test. Because we're still doing a good job if we find that the, the judgment should be is, is poor, that is, if our test evidence shows that we should not go live with this product, we've still done a good job as testers, if the evidence supports that. So it's not so much, as I say, confidence in a product, it's confidence in a decision. 
We are providing decision support for go and no-go decisions. Now, uh, on this particular point, it is important that we remember that we are we're the ones providing evidence, we're not the ones making a judgment. Okay, so if we, if we take a, a courtroom analogy, it's not testers who should be judge and jury as far as the software is concerned. That's always a business decision. That's always a business stakeholder that should make that call. If we want to stick with the courtroom analogy, the, the, the role that we play is that of the expert witness. And our credibility as an expert witness will depend on many things. You know, how good is the evidence we provide? What is our experience? What is our depth of knowledge in the thing that we claim to be experts in? How well are we uh, uh, explaining in layman's terms technical data that we might have uncovered? All of those things are the kind of things that would say, well, this makes a, a, a witness credible. That's the kind of thing that makes a tester credible as well. The other thing to note is that with, when we make these, or when our stakeholders make these go-no-go -no decisions, it's always a question of balancing risk against reward. And it's not really appropriate to try to divorce the two things. If we think that our whole uh, responsibility is providing measures of risk, it becomes a two one-sided question. If we think, well, our job is to uh, avoid risk or to avoid the consequences of risk, then, well, to be honest, the only decision you'll ever make is don't, don't go live. The only way that you can prevent bugs, defects, going into production is don't put code into production. And that's not really a very satisfactory uh, strategy, is it? So we're always balancing risk and reward. But when it comes to our, our measures of risk, well, um, let's, well, let's put it this way. I think there's, there's always been, for every generation, there's been uh, the, the iconic images of, of uh, risk that, trans that transpires, things that turn into actual tragedy. It seems every generation, maybe even every decade, we see the, the next thing that we believe this is the, the high watermark of, of human suffering or, or human tragedy, whether it's by accident or whether it's by, by our own means. For me, growing up in the, uh, the 1980s, it was this image of the, the Challenger shuttle disaster that's really etched itself fairly deeply in, uh, in my memory and my conscience. Because I watched this particular tragedy unfold live on TV. I was watching this, uh, the, this launch when the Challenger blew up, uh, I think, uh, two and a half minutes into the, into the launch procedure. Now, it's a matter of, of fairly well-known record that the uh, root cause of that particular accident was a failure of the very large O-rings in the solid rocket motors uh, that, that essentially provide a, a seal between two large sections of metal and stopping the hot gases getting out. Those O-rings failed, uh, high pressure gases escaped, caught fire, caused the, uh, the devastating explosion. Now, you might say, well, these are incredibly complex machines and this is an incredibly uh, risky endeavor putting people into space. Given all the moving parts in a rocket that could go wrong, something had to go wrong someday, didn't it? So on this occasion, it happened to be the O-rings and, and seven people unfortunately lost their lives. But if we dismiss this as, well, it's there for a, a one in a million accident, well, then we're, we're, we're failing to see the reality of what happened there. Now, I don't want to trivialize the situation that people went through, but the, the uh, NASA and in particular the Morton Thiokol engineers that were involved in putting this, uh, this shuttle into space in that particular day uh, had the equivalent of uh, a, a, a pre-production launch meeting. A, a go-no-go -no -go decision was made uh, the night before. And there was really only one topic of conversation in that go-no-go -no -go decision meeting. 
It was, are the O-rings going to fail tomorrow? And before we, we, we jump to the, the somewhat um, populist conclusion that what was happening here was these were the, the brave and honest engineers that were saying, well, we told you that this was going to happen, but you, you impatient uh, NASA managers concerned about losing government funding you know, if you uh, delay the launch, you know, that we're the good guys who are right and you're the bad guys who are wrong. That's a, that's a rather simplistic reading of this particular situation. Because we have to sort of delve into the, the you know, put ourselves in the, uh, the, the, the situation of the people that were involved in that go-no-go -no -go decision. This was um, something that you might describe as the, the conference call from hell. I think we've all sort of been on through pretty bad international, multi-person, multi-site conference calls. Well, this was really the, the mother of all conference calls. This was before the days of, of Skype and PowerPoint and so forth. So there was no screen sharing. There was no sort of easy live chat. There was a sort of fairly poor quality telephone line that had to link three different offices. There were about 30 people in total involved across those three sites. And what they had was photocopies of a fax of a 25 page document of which this was the, the cover page. But here you can see it, this was the one thing they were discussing was temperature concern on SRM, which stands for solid rocket motor joints. And that's the date, the eve of the launch. Now, um, there is an interesting extra thing where, so this was a, a three hour meeting between six and 9 p.m with this little thing saying, followed by new conclusion sheet. We'll, we'll, we'll get into what that means in, in a bit. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, and of course the details don't matter. After all, it's rocket science, and we don't, we're not expected to digest this quickly. But it, the medium was a mix of this kind of data, so fairly dense typewritten sheets, uh, others were handwritten notes of this, this kind of form. And it was a, you know, a fairly hastily cobbled together collection of bits of paper from a number of different people. Um, there's a bit more like this. So there were various mentions of uh, uh, evidence from testing that the, the Morton Thiokol engineers had, uh, had done as far as the, uh, the solid ro rocket motor uh, joints work were concerned. So here's probably the only page in those, uh, as I say there was 20 to 30 pages in, in all. This was really the only one that, that showed a direct, and in this case fairly linear, uh, relationship between decreasing temperature of the O-rings, and this is the temperature in Fahrenheit, versus uh, a particular property called shore hardness. Now that's just really a, a function of how squishy the, the rubber is uh, in terms of doing its job of, of seating into, the, uh, uh, into place and providing a, a, a reliable seal. The trouble with this is that although it shows that the, the O-rings get harder as they get colder, there's nothing to show well, what's the cutoff point, what's the danger level, you know, what's, what's a good shore hardness versus a dangerous shore hardness. So it was sort of tantalizingly close to sort of showing some good evidence, some good compelling evidence that, okay, given what we know about tomorrow's uh, uh, weather, that this is going to be, you know, beyond the, the, the threshold of danger. So it goes on and on, various things, as I say, all of a similar nature and probably a pretty difficult thing for, uh, uh, for people to digest easily. Now, the, the final page, at least the final page of the original facts, um, made these, you know, did, did summarize the situation fairly well. Came up with just two clear recommendations. One is that the O ring temperature should be at least 53 degrees Fahrenheit at launch. And then it's followed by some test evidence that says, well, we've had development motors uh, operating between 47 and 52. Uh, that had no blow-by, again, that's, uh, that's uh, evidence of uh, a sealed ring. And solid rocket motor number 15, which was an actual thing that uh, um, they, they put through a simulator, uh, they're saying that worked uh, 
uh, okay at 53 degrees, but that was the coldest example they had. And then the second recommendation is that they, you should project the ambient conditions of temperature and wind in order to determine launch time. So a pretty basic piece of advice. Work out how cold it's going to be and decide what is the safe time to launch based on the, the weather forecast. Now it's, it's alleged that, you know, I wasn't there in the meetings, so I can't be certain of this, but uh, it was alleged that at this point a, a, a particular NASA manager shouted down the line, my god Thyacol, when do you want me to launch? April? And so there was this, this awkward situation following where essentially the NASA management hadn't really heard the news that they wanted, they're not sure that they all understood what the evidence was really pointing to, and they said okay, we've heard the engineering data, or we've heard, we've heard the message from the engineers, now you as a contractor, talking to Morton Tharacol, who was the, the company responsible for these, these solid rocket motors, they said you now need to make a management decision. And you could sort of interpret that as, well, go away and come back with the answer that we want to hear, not the answer that you're giving us. So this was the extra page that was faxed to them some hours later and signed by uh, Joe Kilminster, uh, the, the Vice President at, at Morton Farkle. Uh, and so you've got these sort of rather disconnected set of statements here. The, the first sort of half dozen or so are really repeating what the original brief had said, which is that, okay, we know it's going to be 20 degrees colder than the last test of solid rocket motor number 15. Uh, then they sort of get a bit wishy-washy, the data is not conclusive for predicting primary O-ring blow by. We do uh, assess that the colder O-rings will have increased effective durometer, that is they'll be harder, harder O-rings take longer to seat, uh, and more gas might, might bypass. But here's an interesting thing. It says on this, this, uh, this point here, if the primary seal does not seat, the secondary seal will seat. Now, that seems to be a big leap of logic, you know, given you've got a bunch of engineers who've just given you a whole lot of quite firm data on when uh, O-ring seat and when they don't. And the idea is saying, ah, well, you know, if the first ones don't, don't seal, the second one will catch, you know, these gases. That seems a pretty remarkable uh, statement to make. And here's the fateful final recommendation. Morton Farkle Incorporated recommends that SDS 51L, that's the challenger, the launch proceeds on the 28th of January, and that it won't be significantly different from the previous launch. Well, of course it was. The, in the aftermath of all this, well, there was a, um, a presidential, uh, sorry, a, 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 yeah, a presidential inquiry. Uh, the chairman of that inquiry made this, uh, th this rather um, telling statement. So failures in communication resulted in a decision to launch based on incomplete and sometimes misleading information. And here's the really important bit. It was a conflict between engineering data and management judgments. Now, as I say, I, I, I hope that no one is ever in a situation that's quite as high stakes as this one in terms of your own job and uh, your own responsibilities, but it's that last statement that I think we all need to, to tap into and say, I think, well, I think as an industry, we need to be responsible for correcting that problem, for trying our best to remove that conflict between engineering data and management judgments. That's really the, the uh, aim that I have of using better ways of communicating data using better ways of making evidence more compelling and more convincing so that management do make the right judgments. And for that, we really need to realise that it's worth investing a bit of extra time and effort when we know the risk is higher. So we do need to, I think, take a bit of care and a bit of thought about what judgment, what decision is going to be made based on the test evidence, the test results that I'm providing. 
and therefore how much is it worth taking the extra care to make sure the best possible choice is made given all the evidence that I could provide and all the ways in which I could provide. So I have a, a, a belief that making good use of visualizations is a way to do that. And the reason for this is that we are hardwired to be more uh, responsive to visual uh, signals than, than, than any other sense. Just think about what is the phrase we use when we reach upon agreement or understanding. I see your point. Ah, I see what you mean. What an interesting phrase that is. I see what you mean. That's exactly what I'm trying to tap into here, is that we know that we uh, use this phrasing because it's like saying, well, I will believe something when I see it. We've used this phrase a lot, that seeing is believing, but it's also that seeing is understanding. And to give you a sense of just how powerful that, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the brain's prioritization of believing what it sees over every other sense, um, we need to go through a little, uh, a little bit of an exercise. Plus, you know, uh, I put you on a bit of a downer with that sad story about a challenge. Right? I need to, uh, I need to lift you up a little bit. So we've, we've, we're going to have a little bit of audience participation here, and it's about uh, a little bit of talent selection. Okay, so I'm putting together a bit of a boy band. Okay, uh, and I found out that Lady Gaga has these identical triplet brothers. They're not very well known, certainly not as well known as Lady Gaga. But they're called Baron Baba, Dr. Dada, and Viscount Vava. Now, because they're identical triplets, they, you can't tell them apart. They all look exactly like that guy. But what they can do, because they, all, they each sing their own special lyrics. Now, I think you can guess it, but Baron Baba sings the lyrics Baba, Baba, Baba. Dr. Dada. He's the Russian one. He says, da, 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 da. That should be nice and easy. And Viscount Vava, you can guess, sings va, 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 va. Now, so I'm going to divide the audience up to be fans of each of these guys, OK? So if you're in the front part of the room, which means if you're ahead of the, the monitors, if you can't see a big TV screen, then you're in the front section, you're Baron Baba's fans, OK? So when you hear Baron Baba sing ba ba, you go crazy, okay? You, he, he's your guy. Um, those who are in the middle, that is between the two sets of monitors, you're Dr. Dada's fans, okay? When you hear Dada, that's where you go wild, all right? Give a, give a big cheer. And finally, all the people behind the second set of monitors, so that's pretty much everyone else in the room, you're Viscount Vava's fans, all right? Have we got it? Okay, so I'm going to play a little clip, okay, where each of them will sing and you have to go crazy when you hear your guy, okay? So Baron Baba, Dr. Dada, and at the back, Viscount Vava. You get it? And the band is called the McGurk Effect. same time. You have to spot which is your guy, okay? Watch closely. Okay, you identified correctly? Try looking at somebody else. 
or close your eyes and listen without watching. Then open them again. It's weird. Close your eyes and then open them again. Okay, and it's done. So they were all singing exactly the same sound. There was only one sound being played. And for the record, that was ba, 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 ba. So that's the sound you heard when you closed your eyes. And yet, we are so compelled, we are so familiar with what the shape of the lips do to make a d, d sound, or a b, b sound, or a v, v, because we know exactly where the, the tongue and the teeth and the lips are going for each of those sounds. When we see that, we are absolutely convinced that we hear that sound even though we're not hearing that sound. We are seeing the sound instead of hearing it. So we need to be aware of this particular syndrome. It is known as the McGurk effect. And it's a, an illusion that, that, <laughs> that doesn't go away even when you're aware of it. So the only way to avoid it is literally to close your eyes and that's the only way to not hear the sounds that you, you think you're hearing because of what you're seeing. Now, it's an extreme version, but we sort of have lesser versions of this all the time. If we think about where there's a conflict, a classic example is you're attending a conference talk. The speaker puts some slides up and starts saying something. Well, you haven't heard what they've said because you're reading something. So if there's anything different between what there is being shown versus what is being said, you'll remember what, what you read on the screen because you saw it rather than what you were hearing. So we will always prioritize what we see over what we hear. So we need to be very, very conscious that we, we don't provide a conflict in what we uh, show versus what we, what we say. Okay, now I need to give you some, uh, uh, well, some some tips for how we might visualize data. The first and rather obvious one is about putting data in context. Now, let's start with a, a raw fact, and it's, it's a somewhat raw one. I know the contrast isn't great, but I put it in red just because it's a pretty, um, uh, well, it's a pretty awful thing to contemplate, if I'm honest. So the, the numbers I'm showing you were actually from 2008, but you know, this, this, this is still fairly consistent. Um, so this is the annual spending uh, by the US government on the military. So the military budget for one year, uh, 607 billion US dollars. And I could have said, well, is that true or false? And asked for a show of hands. Well, the fact is that that was true in 2008. It would be a difficult thing to answer unless you happen to be an expert in you know, international military budgets, because the number is so big that it's it's almost impossible to, to visualize. It's impossible to even make sense of what amount that is. So here's one way to do it. Well, you put it next to the next highest budgets in the world. And China is in second place, at least it was in 2008, and that was 61 billion. So almost 10 times bigger than its, its number two uh, rival. Um, there's the UK at 60, uh, Russia comes in at about 7th place on, on 36 uh, billion US dollars. Um, so that's one way of showing the comparison. Another would be to show, well, it swallows up the next nine countries. So you know, add all of those budgets together, uh, you still haven't spent the entire US budget. Or compare it to what else could one do with that money? Well. Um, I'm sure the African debt has, has increased a bit since 2008, but at the time, about five months' worth of military spending would have eliminated the entire continental debt of Africa. Now, but here's an interesting thing. We could say, oh, those, those terrible warmongering Americans, you know, of course, you know, this, this is obscene that they spend that amount of money. But we've got to put that in context. It's a very rich country with a very large economy very large spending power. And so when you take the spending as a proportion of its gross domestic product, it actually doesn't look quite so bad. 
So given what they could have spent, 4% is actually relatively modest, if, if I'm honest. And looks pretty small compared to Burma or Myanmar's spending, where fully one quarter of the gross domestic product is spent on the military. So it's about sort of understanding what is the scale of this issue or the scale of this problem given the context in which that number exists. So um, what, what consequences does that have for us? Well, I think the military spending number is a little bit like a raw bug count number. So instead of $607 billion spent on the, on the military, what if we said, oh, we had 607 defects in our software this year? Well, that's a thing we tend to do a lot, and we don't realize that, again, that's not a particularly useful raw figure to have. What might be better? Well, if I wanted to use the you know, spending as a proportion of our, of our income, maybe I'd express it something like this, saying, well, we had a defect density of, it's a made-up number, 32.1 uh, defects per thousand lines of code. In other words, we know that defects are a product or a, a consequence of writing code. Therefore, the more code we write, we expect more defects. So it's more useful to show this as a ratio because then I can compare one period against another in a meaningful way. Did my defects go up just because we released twice as much code as last year? And if so, I would expect the defect density to go down. Um, but again, 32.1 is a somewhat arbitrary number. How do I know if that's good or bad? So uh, the, the, the best way to present this data would be to say, OK, how did that compare to previous releases we did? Or um, indeed, you know, how does that compare against our industry peers? Um, how do we compare against Microsoft, which comes in at an average of uh, 15 defects per thousand lines of code? Or if we really want to set the bar higher, uh, NASA, in spite of having poor management decisions, actually managed to have pretty good code, uh, and they clock in at around about three defects per thousand lines of code. So that would be a better way to, uh, uh, to present the data. The other thing about visualization is about revealing the things that we can't see uh, ourselves. Now, here's, here's one of my favorites, and this, sh this, this, this should be a, a topic that uh, uh, you're familiar with uh, from school. This is, uh, well, I am, I'm hesitating to say it's the first, because everyone likes to say, oh, this is the first example of, some, of one thing or another. Um, but I've yet to find an earlier example of what we would consider a modern day infographic that dates earlier than this one. So the guy responsible for this is a, 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 an early data scientist called Charles Menard. And this is quite, quite a, a remarkable infographic. It does take a little bit of uh, talking through to make sense of it, but it's essentially plotting uh, the size as well as the uh, uh, route that Napoleon's invading army took um, in coming all the way here to, to Moscow. So uh, if I look at this beige line here, that's the, the advance to Moscow. The black line represents the, the retreat back in the other direction. And the width of the line is the size of the army at that point. So there are varying accounts as to how many um, people were in the, the Grand Armée uh, at the time that it uh, crossed the, uh, the river Nima. Some people say 600,000, some people say 450,000. Charles Menard put that at 422,000. So the idea is that the width at this point here is 422,000 men. And you see that it gets thinner as it works its way towards Moscow through various places. I know you can't see these, but you've got things like this is uh, Polotsk up here, and uh, Smolensk, I think, and Vilnius, I believe. So it shows a couple of interesting things. You have one little band of, of soldiers, 10,000, I think, that went up there. Uh, this is another group that divided off to go and fight the battle at Palot. But this steady thinning is the effect of the incredibly severe uh, winter of 1812 um, on the size of that army. 
So we only had a quarter of the original size, so 100,000 men ended up marching into Moscow and a similar number leaving by the, the southern route uh, um, the, the, the following year, 1813. And again, we see a very rapid decline in the size of that army as the, uh, the severe winter and, and the uh, uh, effect of the, uh, uh, the Russian soldiers takes place. We see a, a brief swelling of the ranks when the battalion at Polotsk rejoins them. But uh, by this stage, we're suffering terrible morale, terrible health conditions, uh, and still incredibly cold weather. The line gets smaller and smaller until it's only that wide when they finally get back to the River Nima. So as it says, uh, fewer than 10,000 men return out of that 422,000 that, uh, that, that, that first crossed it. So you've got some other interesting data points on here as well. This line here is supposed to show what was the average temperature at those, uh, those points. Now it's a slightly different scale, but uh, essentially we're seeing averages of, I think, between minus 20 and minus 30 degrees at the, at the coldest points. So an, an incredibly uh, rich amount of data and quite a story that that's telling in a very you know, condensed form. So this was really the, the idea of being able to show multiple aspects behind a story in, in, you know, in one sort of simple uh, but powerful graphical form. So yeah, I like to think of it as the, uh, uh, the original infographic. Let's move the clock forward to the modern day. Um, here's an example of uh, a, a, a simple visualization that's showing the uh, positions that a footballer uh, took. In this case, uh, the example is Theo Walcott playing for Arsenal against Barcelona. Um, uh, a, a heat map of his position on the field. Now, um, I'm not really a football fan, so I, was, I wasn't familiar with this when I first came across it, and I thought, well, that's a really neat idea, especially because it works very intuitively. If you think about it, you don't really need any explanation of what that's showing. Something about the color scheme or just the nature of it means that you can almost work out straight away what that's telling you. So it's probably because we can sort of imagine that you know, Theo Walcott's football boots scuffing up the turf of the football pitch according to where he's running around and sort of having, leaving this effect of making the, uh, the pitch go uh, darker red to, to muddy brown depending on where he's spending most time. So it already, even though it's a, it's a visualization of something that doesn't exist because it's multiple data points taken over the course of a football game, our, our brain instantly responds positively to it and intuitively to it. Of course, there are simpler types of visualizations that don't require complex uh, programming to do it. Here's, here's a, something that I always encourage uh, organizations to do, is if you've got a public-facing product, show a monitor that's always showing what is, what is the public saying about your product on Twitter or other social media forms um, uh, at, at this very moment. And do that by, well, you can search just for your product name, but if you've got something that's popular, do a combination of your product name and, and hashtag fail or a sad face or something like that. Um, I pick on HSBC Bank for this particular example because I bank with them and their software is pretty awful. So they deserve to be publicly shamed. Um, so yeah, you just keep a, a live Twitter, Twitter wall visible and everyone in your team can see what people are saying about your product uh, live. Um, a, a simple uh, Wordle is a useful way of, of visualizing dense amounts of uh, documentation. And one of the things that I like to do is to do a, a word or comparison of uh, a, an acceptance test suite. So if our, uh, we're using specification by example, behavior driven development, eliminate the noise words like given, when and then, and say what sort of terminology are we putting into our tests? And how does that compare to a wordle of say our user documentation? In other words, do we have an appropriate balance of the right domain terms and concepts and functions 
that we talk about in our, in our uh, feature documentation versus our test suite. Okay, let's look at the idea of, well, the, some of the, the, the dangers of, uh, of scale. Um, who's familiar with this particular image? Who knows what this is? Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty recognizable. If you've spent any time in London, you'll know what this is. So it's, it's well, it's the London tube map, but I, 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 I put inverted commas around that because it's not really a map, it's a schematic. It's a representation that's optimized for helping you to navigate the underground system. And the reason, therefore, it's not a map is because it's not geographically accurate. And yet, for many people who visit London, this really is their map of London. This is the thing that they're referring to most often because they're using it all the time to get around. And so it, it, it creates the impression that this is what London looks like above ground. But of course, there are many examples, and my favourite is uh, my, I come into uh, Paddington Station in the west of, of London, and if you wanted to get, say, into the city like Bank or St Paul's, you might be tempted to say, okay, the thing to do is go down the Circle Line to Notting Hill Gate, change the Central Line, and go across. But in fact, what you do is you get out and you walk to Lancaster Gate. Now it looks like a long way on that map. But if we redrew this so that it was geographically accurate, then that's what the tube map would actually look like. So the same lines, the same station names, but actually where those places exist. And that's where you can see that it is a pretty short walk between Paddington and Lancaster Gate, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go that direction, only to come back here in order to go east into the city. So that's... Uh, that's the problem with a tube map that's, that's been optimized for one purpose but is actually misrepresents another. Well, surely you think, well, the map of the world, we know this, this is accurate, isn't it? Well, again, it's accurate only in one sense. So the traditional map is known as the Mercator projection. And it was designed to make sure that the angles on shorelines are correct. As it's, I, I don't know the technical details, but it's something to that effect. The result is, the, the problem with that is what we're trying to put a map of a 3D spherical surface onto a, a flat 2D surface, i.e. a page in a map. And that presents a problem. So this Mercator projection was optimized for people traveling by sea. They want to be able to set a course and know that if they continue on that course, they'll end up at the right place as far as the map is concerned. But the consequence is that the size of the countries is not preserved. And so we again have grown up believing that Greenland is about as big as South America. This is the Peters projection that does preserve the correct size of, of countries. And that's where you actually see the reality of things like, well, just how big Africa is compared to every other continent. Similarly for South America, and from my homeland of Australia, which actually turns out to be uh, bigger than America, which surprises many Americans. <laughs> Doesn't surprise Australians, though. No. <laughs> now, speaking of Americans, um, remember, remember when US presidents looked and sounded like this? Ah, the good old days, yeah. Um, so, Barack Obama, when he was making his uh, re-election speech in 2012, had this phrase, which I thought was rather, rather uh, compelling. Um, he said, where not as divided as our politics suggest, we remain more than a collection of red states and blue states, we are the United States. And it was his attempt to try to you know, bring together the country and, and get a sense of, of uh, emphasizing what is common to people's beliefs rather than trying to continue to paint this picture that there's a, there's a binary divide in terms of people's beliefs. And of course what he was referring to is these classic US election maps that show states going green, going green states going red or states going blue. Um, and of course what that reflects is the slightly peculiar American electoral system whereby 
an entire state does either go one way or the other, even though the, the, the balance of uh, votes within that might be quite tight. And the problem with this representation of the way America is or the way the American votes is that the land doesn't vote. It's people that vote. And so we really get a very inaccurate and, and somewhat biased representation of, oh yeah, well, Texans, they're all, they're all conservative, or Californians, they're all Democrat. Well, of course, it's much more nuanced than that. So one of the things that we can do, because we're using a map that's trying to represent land area to actually show uh, in voting intentions or voting results for people, we kind of need a different uh, style. So we can use something called a cartogram. And a cartogram is, is a, uh, a map where we scale the size of the elements within that by some other property, in this case, by population. So here we've got a somewhat distorted view of the United States where heavily populated states become larger and less populated states become smaller. So the Northeast, for example, densely populated, grows in size. The Midwest, you know, the wheat belt uh, uh, shrinks. But even looking at that, it doesn't necessarily show the, as I say, the, the nuance of individual uh, voter behavior. So let's look at another view of the, the election results. This is down at the county level rather than by state level. So regardless of the electoral college, this is how do particular counties uh, vote. And here you think, well, it's a, it's a wonder that, that Obama got in at all. It looks like a, a sea of, of conservative red. But again, if we turn that into a cartogram, we see it's because essentially the heartland, the, the, the middle of, of America, is largely rural and, and quite sparsely populated. Uh, and hence we see now there's more blue than there is uh, red. But again, we've still got this problem of binary. It's not even a whole county voting one way or another, is it? So here's another view. This is your counties where we put shades of purple according to what is the proportion of voting one way or another. And now we can see it's a bit more of a, of a blend. We can again turn that into a cartogram and we end up with something a bit more like that. And here we see that it's a much less, you know, <laughs> It's certainly much less black and white, but it's less uh, red and blue as well. So maybe Obama's words were actually quite prophetic, that uh, when you see the spread of voter intention according to population on a cartogram, then maybe you see that, yeah, there's, there's a spread of politics everywhere you go through America. Now, the idea of the cartogram is something that you can also be applied in, in uh, 3D form. So I thought I'd, I'd pop this in. This is a sort of scientific representation known as the Penfield homunculus. Essentially, it's a cartogram of the human nervous system. And because we have two, uh, uh, two nervous systems, or two cortexes as they're known, one for sensitivity, i.e. the nerves that allow us to feel and respond to things, and then there's the motor cortex, which is the nervous system that allows us to actually move, move things. Um, these are the two representations of those, uh, uh, those nervous systems. So one way to think of it is, it's like saying, if we spread the nerve endings in our body out evenly, this is the shape we would become. So hands and lips, clearly both uh, sensitive and dexterous, become very, very big and other parts of the body become very small. Now, they are quite similar in size, and it makes sense that, in general, we are both uh, dexterous, that is, we have the ability to, to make fine movements in the same areas that we have uh, high sensitivity. Um, but there are some exceptions, and I think the, the gentleman in the audience will, will recognize that there's at least one part of the body where we have fairly high sensitivity, but we have absolutely no control. Um, so, yeah, uh, but again, a useful representation that allows us to have a better understanding of what we're actually representing, and we're not trying to force that into a, a, a map or a shape that's, uh, that's not optimized for that purpose. We can do the same things for our software systems. 
I'm sure you know you will have architecture diagrams of your the software that you're testing back at the office and you probably use it on a regular basis to talk about you know test coverage and so forth. But these architecture diagrams are a little bit like the London tube map. That is, they've been optimized for readability and understandability for a particular purpose. That is, what are the components in our system? What are the names of these various things? And you know, I'll make the box big enough to put that, that name in it. That's pretty much the, uh, the extent of the decisions I'm making. I might maybe change some things or positions so that the area is a little easier to connect and so forth. But what if we turn that into a cartogram? What if we scaled these things for different purposes that might be interesting to testing? What if we scaled them by the number of lines of code there are in there? You know, if we follow the, the, the basic defect density principle, then we can assume that the more code there is, the more, the more bugs there are in that area. So what if we scale those by that, that, that basis? Or if we scale them according to uh, a bit like the, the, the heat map of, of Theo Walcott's movements, what if we could show on a, on a software architecture diagram where a user is spending most time? Maybe we could use our analytics data to actually get a sense of this is where people are pressing the most, this is where they're spending the most time. And indeed by value or by risk, we could, there's all sorts of uh, uh, properties we could apply that would determine uh, how big we make each of these boxes. And indeed if we, if we uh, um, did this with risk, it's almost certain that the, the, that the connection of the legacy mainframe you know, wouldn't just be this innocent box in the corner, it would probably end up looking something like that. Okay, so we've looked at uh, uh, issues of, uh, of scale. We need to look into some of the dangers of getting visualization wrong or, or taking some, some slightly wrong steps with it. Um, I don't want to pick on any particular tool, but I think there are some things that visualize for the sake of it and don't really think about what is the information they're trying to convey. So this is actually an early version of uh, Team City. So there are other software uh, products that do a similar thing that are trying to provide uh, representations of aspects of your code base in, in graphical form. The trouble with this is that unlike the footballer heat map, where we could instantly see what that was telling us, you'd need to interpret this. You'd need to say, well, what, what, what are the different properties? What determines the size? What determines the color? What determines the height? And here it shows you that the color is, well, it's the complexity. Um, so it's green for low complexity and red for high complexity. The height is the number of changes made. And the size is the number of lines of code. And you sort of think, well, I'm just not sure that my brain necessarily uh, uh, allots those things in an, in an intuitive way. So I would always have to go back to a key like this to try and make sense of a graph until that became something that started to become intuitive. And some people will say, well, yeah, you learn to read these things and so they do become more immediately informative. But it seems to me that you always have to go through that process for each new person that has to, uh, has to consume it. So the advice is, yeah, don't just visualize for the sake of it, but try to find things that work with the brain and not against it. And in a similar vein, there's tools that will try to give you any kind of complex dashboard you uh, care to dream up. Uh, I think personally, I think this is just going a bit crazy, the idea that I can say I can put a percentage on technical debt uh, am I really going to be sitting there you know, getting on the phone to the, the developers? Oh my God, technical debt's just hit 11%. You know. Do something about it, you know? Uh, I just don't think that's, uh, that, 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 that's really going to happen. So whilst you know, some managers might salivate over the idea that, oh yes, this is fantastic, I could see it all in one place, I'm not convinced that it would really lead to uh, uh, correct behaviors. Um, and code coverage, uh, you know, color coding on the basis of test coverage, rather, is, uh, is also fraught with danger. So this, again, is a real example from a client of mine where uh, a particular defect got through to production. And so they were interested in doing a, an analysis. They said, well, we've, 
we've got some automated tests and we measure our, our test coverage, what does that tell us about this, this defect? Did this appear in the, the, the low tested area of our system? Um, now, I know the contrast isn't great there, but this is sort of red, this is yellow, and this is green. It looks perfect on my machine, said the developer. Um, the actual place where this particular production defect occurred was in this part of the code base, the, the thing that was green, or at least greenest, as far as the, uh, the, the, the test coverage visualization was concerned. And that's because what we're seeing is a problem of color bias, that is, it was greener than the other areas. Also, it was an averaging out of several different parts of the fairly large part of the code base. So, yes, on average, this was more tested than the others, but that in itself was patchy. So, we had some very well tested, some very green parts, but some red parts, and sure enough, it was the the bit that somebody didn't test, that's where that uh, particular production defect uh, was sourced. Um, there's also the problem of where do you, uh, uh, what sort of perspective do you put on your, your visualizations? Uh, anyone who's flown, I'm sure, is, is familiar with this, uh, this syndrome, um, although you might not be flying over the North Sea, but if you've got the wrong scale or the wrong perspective on where you're trying to show where someone is, then it's not particularly helpful. So it's not useful to tell me that the plane is over the, over the water if I don't really have any other reference point on there. Um, equally, if I'm on a journey from London to Oslo, I don't particularly need to know where I am in relation to Dar es Salaam in Africa. So we really want some kind of representation that's in the middle and then does show me something useful that shows my starting point, shows my destination, and then I can get a sense of where we are uh, on, the, on the journey. Okay, so those were some of the dangers. Um, we're now going to look at what are the things that you can use in order to provide visualizations of your own. And uh, I don't want to um, create the impression that it's all about some high-tech tools. So this is sort of a little schema to show that there is a range of stuff out there. So there are things that are uh, uh, at the, the high-tech end, but there's also equally valuable things that are at the low-tech end. And some of those are generalized, that is, you can use them for any visualization purpose you like. Others are more specialized, that is, they are you know, pre-configured or, or, or optimized for a particular uh, purpose. So let's start with my favorite, which happens to be right down here in this bottom right corner. That is, it's the most general, but it's also arguably the, the lowest tech. And that's just a plain old whiteboard. It's the cheapest thing to use. It's certainly the easiest to get started with. And you can pretty much do anything that your imagination allows. But what's the real power of this is that I see a syndrome that's played out over and over again. I do this in training courses, but I also do it in my uh, coaching and, and uh, consulting. And uh, the, this, the, the syndrome is that if you've got something that's hand-drawn, it's, it's unique and therefore people invest their attention in it. Um, I'll show you what I mean. Well, this picture here is uh, from a, a client I was working with uh, fairly recently. And they had, okay, so this is their, their basic Kanban board. And I'd said, well, somebody had said it would be useful to have um, a representation of the software architecture, like an architecture diagram, uh, somewhere handy for us to be able to talk about and refer to. And one of the BAs said, oh, yep, yep, I can do that. We've already got such a thing, and I'll just print it out. And uh, so he printed it out, and this is it, sort of stuck to the bottom of the board here. And that must have sat there for a good couple of weeks. No one ever referred to it. No one so much as mentioned it or touched it or pointed to it. Then one day I said, well, for this next story, why don't we just draw a, a, a rough diagram of the architecture that's affected by this, um, that way we can put on the detail that's important to us and we can leave out the detail that's not important to us. And so that's what this 
thing was here, we put it on portable whiteboard and say it was just sketched with whiteboard pens, we stuck it up there. And this is literally the next morning at the stand-up, and this is uh, Duke, the product owner, saying as part of his explanation of what the next story needed to do, he's referring directly to stuff on there, in fact he's drawing extra lines on there and you know, correcting things that are wrong. And it's that immediacy of that information and the fact that we are in control of it as a team that was the really powerful thing. That created the engagement that this nice, you know, neat printout never ever did. So the low tech is, uh, is, is important. Another low tech thing but with a slightly specific purpose is your Kanban board or your scrum board. The basic advice here I'm sure everybody who's in an Agile team already has some version of this, uh, this type of thing. Make sure you identify where individuals are, okay? That's the most important thing, is visualize the work, but visualize who's working on it. Okay, I mean, given the hurry up, Google for Jeff Patton and story maps, I don't have time to talk about that. This is another thing worth Googling, James Bach's low test, uh, low tech test dashboard. The most important aspect about this is this subjective uh, evaluation of quality. Okay? Being able to show what do the testers feel about this particular aspect of the system under test, that's an incredibly important thing to visualize and we ignore it at our peril. So uh, use a, a, a simple means of, of recording that. Um, if you want to go high tech, uh, look at Tableau, this is a commercial product, but you can also experiment with it using the, the, the public version, using public data sets. Um, a, quite a, a rich range of options for uh, uh, different styles of visualizations, designed generally for large data sets. That's really where this comes into its own. And if you really want to roll your own, um, the D3 library is, is your port of call, uh, d3.js. It's a JavaScript library that gives you a vast array of potential visualizations. Um, of course, you do need to write your own code, but if you really want to come up with some custom visualization for specific data within your context, then that's probably uh, where you're going to be able to create something uh, unique to your context. Okay, um, and well, I don't want to go into too much detail, but good old Excel, arguably the most commonly used tool for visualizations. Great tool, but some of the defaults in terms of graphing out of the box don't necessarily give you the best results. So things like uh, your defects, it's probably going to do something like that, putting critical at the top. Always put critical at the bottom, less critical further up so that you get this uh, mountain range type, type effect. Um, Similarly, if you just try to compare sizes of categories, uh, the, the default vertical uh, columns is not the best mode. Uh, the, the, the human brain prefers to compare things using uh, horizontal bars. And finally, pie, chart, pie charts, again, that's a standard thing that, that it's going to do. Better to, rather than use a legend, just put the values directly on it and always um, uh, use a, uh, a, a categorization of anything beyond so. Okay, um, I know my time is up, but there's, there's just one last thing. So these are my key points. I've, I've shown and I'm trying to encourage that uh, you should be using low-tech solutions as your starting point, but I thought I want to leave you with something that gives a little bit of inspiration for the possibilities of just what you can do with data visualizations uh, this little clip, it's only a couple of minutes, um, just shows what's, what, what's possible given big data and imaginative ways of representing it. So I'll let this run.
the sky really is the limit in terms of what's possible. We just need to find the story that our data wants to tell. Thank you very much. Oh, um, uh, books, no, as far as I know, I, I haven't come across um, books in terms of this style of visualization. However, uh, some very good books on uh, best representation of, of data. Edward Tufte is the, uh, uh, the, the reference there. In fact, I'll switch back since that's the only question. Um, so, in the check it out, okay. This is probably the, the, the best source. So, uh, Visual Explanation by Edward Tufte. He's got other uh, books on a similar uh, subject, but that's, that's really the starting point. He's considered the, the father of uh, the science behind how we represent data visually. Um, uh, I would also check out the, uh, the David McCandless uh, site, which is called Information is Beautiful, which is where those uh, early stuff on the, um, uh, the US budget came from. Um, and if you particularly like that, that video at the end, there's a, there's a link to that. So <laughs> you, can, you can go and see some other, other work that that uh, particular studio has done. Um, so, but yes, I would always start with Edward Tufte. Uh, that's, the, that's the starting point. Друзья, еще аплодисментов специально. Спасибо, Владимир. Это, конечно, проект моего шоу